Okay, so we're gonna get started here because we wanna respect uh, not only the time of our panelists, but also uh, the attendees, and, and we have a lot to cover here today. So thank you for joining us, everybody. First, I would like to introduce a couple of my uh, sports business two colleagues, Gene Doris and Mark Jeppers, both very instrumental in helping us run these panels and, and coming up with different ideas. So I appreciate them and their time. The level of discourse in this country is obviously concerning. We have a great group of people here today and they are very successful in their personal and professional lives. Also, more importantly, we have people here who are parents and grandparents, people who are concerned as well as to the future of our children and our children's children. And at the end of the day, we need to start to get this right for them. We may not even agree on everything said here today, but the point is we need to start to work together and come together to be what we are all supposed to be, a human race that is one family regardless of the color of your skin, the language you speak, or the area of the world you're from. If anyone has been watching the CBS Sports vignettes, a lot of people are given their 30 seconds to share their thoughts on this topic. Most are very compelling, but all of them comment on continuing the conversation, having a deeper discussion. And that's all we're trying to do here today. Most of us have competed in team sports and the perspective of team. We know sports can be an effective tool and advocate for change. We hope that maybe we get some practical applications out of today as well. Look, we are not going to solve the world's problems today, all right? But at the end of the day, I know each of these people. I love them. And if they are hurting or if they have something they need to share, then we're happy on behalf of the Institute to help provide this forum. And if it helps one person out there, you know, maybe to clearly understand or help synthesize the message or get them to act or do something different, then I'll be thrilled personally. With that, let's get started by introducing this great group today. Um, you should have a program that was sent earlier if you've registered. Uh, if not, please let me know in the chat and I will send you the program with the full bios of each of our panelists and our terrific moderator. Um, let me start by introducing, because it's always ladies first in my book, Fatu Niang. Fatu is a uh, tremendous uh, business person. She lives in my town of New Canaan, Connecticut. She's got two great sons. One is a, uh, was just drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs this year. The other just graduated high school and they actually helped form a uh, peaceful protest here in New Canaan, which I'm grateful for. My, my daughter attended, it was terrific. They had thousands of people there. And, and I just give her great credit for that. So welcome Fatu. Fatu is also very big in tennis, into the tennis world. So she's got a great sports background. Like I said, her son and my son played high school football together here in New Canaan. So uh, look out for him, Lucas Niang with the Kansas City Chiefs, okay? Uh, Corey Galloway. Corey, um, we have a little trouble getting him on, but we'll, we'll work that out. Corey is an exceptional businessman, owns several businesses in the New York area, fitness clubs in Brooklyn. Uh, he and his wife, Tamara, are also the first black owners of any professional sports team in New York. So Corey uh, has got a lot going on and, and brings a lot to the table as well. Kenyon Rashid. Kenyon uh, comes to us. He's also a, a very successful entrepreneur and businessman after a career, a uh, great college career at Oklahoma football. Uh, also played for the Giants and the Jets. and. Being a Jets fan, I won't get any further into that conversation right now, but um, we appreciate Kenyon taking the time to be with us from California. Derek Canada. Derek is an exceptional young man that I knew uh, back in the day. And I own a college, a great basketball player who came in from uh, West Point, transferred from the U.S. Military Academy into Iona College, was a tremendous player, went out to play with the Harlem Globetrotters, was a, uh, was a coach. Uh, has done a lot of great things in his business career as well. So we also welcome Derek Canada. Kevin Hallinan. Kevin comes to us uh, uh, retired, but he's also very active still in security. He was the senior vice president from uh, security for Major League Baseball, dealing with a lot of issues with players and also fans and, and things of that nature. But Kevin also was a New York City police officer. He was uh, on the FBI task force. Um, he's a guy who brings a little bit of a different perspective, and we look forward to hearing from Kevin. And finally, Lowe's Moore. Lowe's, uh, one of the all-time great basketball players to come out of Mount Vernon, New York, uh, and one of the greatest players to play at West Virginia. 
played in the NBA, has had a stellar career off the court as well. Uh, just recently retired as the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club of Mount Vernon, New York. Um, with best friends uh, with Denzel Washington, but but uh, Lowe's uh, stands on his own in terms of, of what he's done in his career and, and the things he's done. And he's actually done a lot of things in this area as well. He's got a podcast, which I think we'll hear about a, a little bit here today called the Breathe Series. Okay, so that's your panelists. Uh, and uh, welcome everybody and enjoy. Lowe's, I throw it over to you. And uh, thank you again, everybody for taking the time. Yes. Uh, you're welcome, Dave. And I want to say welcome to the business, the Sports Business Institute. Um, I was excited when uh, Dave uh, spoke to me several months ago in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, I think everybody was really in shock and fear about what was happening, you know, with the pandemic first. Um, and that put us all in a state of fear. But then uh, when the other issues, social justice issues started to break out, man, it, it, it kind of took on a new, a new mindset in the midst of a pandemic. So um, I want to thank all the panelists. And I, I think this is hopefully um, a, a, a pebble um, that you could throw in a pond. And hopefully we get a, a ripple effect by some of the experiences and comments that will be shared here this this afternoon. Uh, so the focus is this is a panel series for the, dis the deeper discussion on race relations. And um, the focus also is through the lens of sports. And, and so I, I wanted to read something and and then start out from there, just jump right in it. Right. We said we wanted to be deep. So I'm going to read something and then I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, so let me read this, this is the, uh, the Declaration of Independent Action of the Second Continent Congress, uh, July 4th, 1776. Uh, the Unanimous Declaration of the 13th United States of America. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unenalable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To each of you, to each of the panelists, uh, what does that mean to you? Uh, it means very little, given that it was written when they were actually having slaves. Um, I think it's indicative of how outdated, you know, we are today living off of a constitution that was written, was it 200, 300 years ago? I mean, it's a, it's a, it doesn't really apply to everyone. I think it was a, a general idea um that has yet to be realized my opinion for me i'll say that it is a good intention it started from a good place but the law of the land to kenyan point was sla slavery was still the law of the land at that time and even though the intention was there there are little sentences i mean not in that particular part of the the constitution, but there are certain sentences in the constitution that clearly show that to make the constitution happen, they had to compromise and the compromission was not give black people any right basically, or no actual right. And those are the things that need to be amended if the country is to move forward. I think uh, <clears throat> those words are to a great extent the American dream, which clearly hasn't been accomplished. But truly, for me, it's a goal. And it's a continual goal for all of us to get better, for all sides to keep striving. This is, somebody told me a while back, this isn't supposed to be heaven. We have to continue to work and work hard to make things better. And I believe, quite honestly, what unfortunately has happened, uh, we have to learn from it. And we have to, you know, we, ha we just have to continue to use this as an opportunity 
for understanding, for better communication. But it's it's up to all of us to get it done. So so all of you. What what about you, uh, Derek? Um, as I look at it, it wasn't it wasn't written with inclusion in mind. Um, it was written for the people who were pursuing their dream. Um, we were basically left out of that um, because we weren't looked at as men at that time. Um, and so when they say all men are created equal, but you don't include a group of people as being men or human, um, your inclusion piece is totally left out. So I would agree that it would be uh, the American dream. Unfortunately, we've been kind of disenfranchised and left out of that from the earlier days. Um, and we're, we're working toward progressing toward that um, today. So, uh, Corey, do you have, uh, you have any comments on that? Uh, I know you just jumped on. Corey is still muted. See if we can get Corey to unmute himself. All right. Well, let, yeah, well, so each and every one of you is saying we're still in a dream. I mean, we've been in a long, long dream. I mean, uh, you know, and inside of it, uh, inside of these words um, could be an opportunity for growth, uh, opportunity for change. Uh, if you if you really uh, dove into it and really got into a deeper conversation, not with just one culture, but, um, you know, a very diverse uh, a meeting or a, a very diverse conversation, even past conversation, that you could actually put this into some action. I mean, you can make it some action points, you know, because, you know, even, you know, a number of us don't feel like we have, you know, equal, equal rights or, or that uh, we're free and uh, that we're happy. I mean, you know, so, uh, but it's, this is, this is, this is, this is an opportunity that uh, we, we could look at this and, and say, you know, like you said, here, here are the faults and, and how do we make this a practical application is, is, is the real deal. So, um, so, you know, I want to give you lay some rules. I just threw that out there for the first question, just to get you, get you kind of moving. Uh, I don't know if you expected that or not, but uh, it kind of gets us thinking right away. And, and so uh, uh, Dave sent me some, you know, a description of how this, how this would go. So uh, this is the first of three parts that we would address issues of social justice through the eyes of those who have lived it, right? And I guess that's your guys, you guys that have lived it. So, uh, you know, that, that's going to be a very important uh, in a few minutes. So, uh, so let, let's look there. I'll say these real quickly, right? There's according uh, to my research, there are, nine biggest, the nine biggest social issues in 2020 are voting rights. Number one, voting rights, climate justice, health care, uh, refuge crisis, racial injustice, uh, uh, income gaps, uh, gun violence, hunger and food and insecurities. But we are pulling out of this race relations. So that's, that's, that's our focus um, today. So uh, we will examine the roles of, of, of sports as it plays, it's played and, and can uh, raise awareness to these issues and to be an instrument for effective change. So the, the first question I have here, uh, let me see if I can get it back up here. Question number one. Um, let's see here. So question number one, you know, was, was actually in, and in, in a part of this process is, uh, to number one, first listen to number two, be open in our communication and then ultimately provide some action. And, and so the first one, the first question is, you know, based on what Dave had explained, each and every one of you have ha have an experience in regards to social justice. If you would just share with the audience what that is, you know, in terms of social justice, what does that mean? What is your experience in that? Who's going to go through the gate first? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I guess I will start. 
Um, ladies first. Ladies first, exactly. Um, it is such a broad term uh, when we say social justice because you don't even know where to start. Every time you touch an aspect of what could be social justice, the ramification to all the other elements is just overwhelming almost. And sometimes when people are overwhelmed, the only thing they do is just stop moving and nothing gets done. And I think um, we have to look at it at maybe a small chunk at a time because the way certain um, neighborhood were built, there is injustice in the fundamental way of the development of different neighborhood, predominant African uh, American uh, neighborhood versus uh, white neighborhoods, uh, access, facilitation of access to um, or convenience to everything. It's a little bit harder if you live in a, a, a black neighborhood versus a white neighborhood. You have a highway way to go through. Uh, the bus ride is not making it easy for you. It's like when you, you talk about social justice and people are like, yeah, well, we should, we all are the same. The, so the civil rights movement took care of that. They don't realize it. If you are in a race and we all have a, a 100 yard to, to run to, but your line is clear and open. And on my line, I have to jump into hoops, hurdle, uh, barbed wire. It's the same distance. But the way to point A to point B for, for a black person is not going to be the way the same way from point A to point B for a white person. And I think social justice is going to be very hard to achieve if we don't change the institutional um, racism, but also the structural raci racism and the racism that we have all integrated in our, in our life in the way we, we speak or address issues. Okay. Yeah, I have to agree that, that social, I think the term social justice comes with many, many layers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a blurred line between social justice and social responsibility. Um, we know biases exist for all people. It's not just a race thing. We have biases, personal biases based on our upbringing, based on our culture. Uh, everyone has that, but we should all be able to strive to a social responsibility of respecting each other's cultures and biases if they are reflective in a positive way. Um, I, I think when we throw around general terms like racism and social justice, we have to be careful because we are not drilling down on the layers of how to affect the change of that. Um, we know there's a problem. I think we all know there's a problem. <laughs> the question is, how do we fix it? And that is a, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I would like to get down to it. Um, because if we continue to say there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem without a solution or moving toward a solution that is doable and realistic, um, and that cannot happen overnight. We're not going to all of a sudden tomorrow have social justice for everyone because of what's happening, right? We have to have a plan uh, in place, uh, and that goes with multiple sectors. Uh, it is a financial plan. It's an economic. It's cultural. Um, it, it is a multifaceted uh, movement that we all should be looking at, I believe, um, to address some of the um, the problems that I think have not just started today. I mean, this, I mean, we just have more media and we're actually seeing it now. Uh, but we've known as our community that this thing has been, I mean, we, it's never gone away. I mean, it's there all the time. So the fact that we actually are bringing attention to it, I think is a positive fact. And at least we're getting more conversations built around what the real issues are. Bose, if I could just jump in real fast here. I think yes, we finally have Corey squared away. I don't know what the issues are. I apologize on behalf of uh, of Zoom, I guess. But Corey, welcome. There's Corey. <laughs> no worries. Welcome, no. Corey. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, I actually I was um, able to get in. I just wasn't getting the audio or the um, video. So I was seeing and actually following everything that was going on. So, you know, um, great to be in and 
and enjoy the topic that you guys are discussing and you know get take a crack at you know social justice and how we are able to make a change i do think that it starts to a lot of what everyone was saying is it starts on the micro level and then it goes into a macro level and you know we've approached just having social change and economic change through the similar points of one being economic two policy and three um community and so we've applied all of those to our activities um that we do and owning a sports facility you know owning a sports team and also doing real estate development all within one community which is the brownsville canarsie east new york community and on the real estate side we've invested in um first time home ownership program with in partnership with new york city and goldman sachs and so on that side we're providing first time home owners with you know their homes which allows them to build equity right which mm -hmm. then you know decreases that wealth gap that we have um on the services side we have a sports facility um that is I'd say 90% used by the community. Um, and that's, you know, health and wellness. And then on the just building wealth, again, we employ 95% black um, people in our, in our facility. And that's about 65 people that we have on our payroll. So, you know, the cycle that we're trying to create and, you know, this takes a lot of risk. And that's obviously risk um, from an investor side. You've got to have allies, right? We've put in, you know, I think we put in about six million dollars into this community between the real estate, the team, and the facility. And it hasn't been oh great returns, right? And so, if you talk to an ally, they've got to understand that there is a social investment as well as we're motivated by financial returns as well but you can't lose sight of the social investment and the only way you change where we are is to figure out how to get returns on the improvement of black people and their lives decreasing the wealth gap and then hopefully you know obviously we're driven to make financial returns but that comes from an Traditionally, for me anyways, my partners are non-African American. So it comes from allies who believe in what you're trying to accomplish. Now we do have hard conversations on investment returns, which they beat me up about, rightfully so. But they also understand, wow, you're also making a difference. So we'll beat you up on the financial side, but we see that you're making a difference in this social change. So those, you know, those are the three prongs and then when you start getting deeper into each one of those prongs it becomes more complicated so we're certified nwbe we work with new york city are the policies for nwbes helping minorities more than they're helping women because you may have a lot of women that are not minorities who are married to a non-minority male and goes around the uh, circumvents the process become uh, NWBE. Mm. And so that's one of those things we're talking about. Like, if you want real social change and the things that people want to accomplish, you got to have, you know, real policy that creates real change. And then you go into banking with the same issue. We have $3 million tied up in lines of credits. We person guarantee all of our investments are we're the only investor in the, you know, our projects. And we also have a corporate guarantee. So we're guaranteed three ways and then we have a letter of credit put up as well. And so then it becomes, we need more allies to make a difference. And so social change starts, in my opinion, if you go to Reganomics, if you put it in the hands of the minority entrepreneurs who are really looking to scale their business, looking to build their business, and 
low to moderate income communities because we, the reason our platform, our employees are majority um, black is not by uh, policy because the government forces to, it's because that's just natural. And I think that happens to a lot of people. And natural, you know, blacks that are entrepreneurs or developers, we naturally, our general contractors black, our plumbers are black. And that's not because we're looking for them, it's because that's our network. And so getting, you know, significant assets in the hands of entrepreneurs, not just myself, you got to do this, scale this across the country, you naturally hire, if you look at, you know, um, I'll use bad boy because I know the people that work over there. Diddy's group, you know, majority of the people that work there are black. It's not because he's like, oh, I need to find black people because that's kind of what he knows and that's his network. Same thing at Rock Nation. You may have a lot of white guys that work there, but you also have a lot of blacks that work there. And that's just organic of who the owner is. So the social change does start from, you know, the entrepreneur, the policies, and being mindful of executing, you know, changing the social dynamic. But you can't do that without allies. You have to have allies that have deep pockets that know, hey, we're going to invest this. And we expect these outcomes socially. We expect these outcomes financially. We expect these outcomes from the policy. And then you, when you meet with the mayor's office, or for us, we meet with the mayor or the local senators, you let them know we're going to make investments in this community, but we need to make this investment based on these particular rules that we want to set forth. That's it. Well, yeah, and I think that's important because you, you know, we, we, we're talking about, you know, your experience, each and every one of your experience in regards to social justice, right? And Co Corey, what you have is a model, mm -hmm. right? Something that could be looked at and, and, and expanded upon um, as something that you feel is working in Brownsville or, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, finding our lives are not easy. I mean, <laughs> I'll be, because right. I, I mean, at the end of the day, this is economics. I mean, you, you know, you live in America, yeah. it's a capitalist society, so it come down to money, come mm -hmm. down to dollars. And, and so, but yet we have, as, as a people, we have genius, intelligence, we, we, we have all these, uh, these, things and even creativity is just opportunity, you know, and, um, you know, opportunity to sit at the table. So, uh, uh, Kevin and, and Derek, do you have anything in regards to your experience in terms of, uh, social, uh, justice issues? Well, from, from, from my perspective, um, I'm the father of four young children, uh, grew up in East Orange, New Jersey, which is a predominantly African American community in Essex County, um, right next to Newark, uh, which is also a predominantly African-American community. So we see just in growing up when I first, so I went, I moved to Wisconsin for a while. When I moved back, I brought my wife, uh, who's from New York with me. Um, and I took her for a drive around my neighborhood. Um, so we drove East Orange. Um, then we drove into Bloomfield and Glen Ridge, which are really more affluent. And then we crossed back into East Orange and she could see the stark difference just in the community. So mm -hmm. to, to Corey's point, there are differences in our communities. Um, as a father of four young children or relatively young children in an era or in a time where social media and the ability to access video in an instant um, creates different conversations that I have to have with my children um, with regard to who we are, why we do what we do and how we continue to survive and move forward um, and then also being in a smaller community now, I was able to participate in my first protest with my family. Um, and I thought that was important for me to do, um, even though I, I tend to shy away from a lot of, a lot of communication and confrontation because I'm a, I'm a big black guy. Um, but it was important <laughs> for me to, to go out um, and set an example for my family and allow my children to know that there are things that they can stand up for and that they should stand up for. Um, even if other people cannot. Um, so for me, it's a, there's a lot that goes on on the personal side, especially uh, having three boys um, who are under 20 and growing up in this world. Hmm. Uh, Kevin? Well, I tell you, I think if I throw in Corey, 
has said about it has to be obviously a micro start. It has to begin somewhere. It doesn't happen overnight and there's just so much to do. Interestingly enough, uh, watching a finance show, Corey, you'd be interested in this. Uh, the CEO of Netflix said today that uh, they have distributed a hundred million dollars amongst several uh, black banks. And they, uh, the CEO also said that, that Costco is getting ready uh, to follow the same path. And I think, you know, the private sector of business getting involved in that way, I think it is good, but obviously that's not my field. I, I honestly feel looking obviously as the police are, are at, at the front of this. And uh, I, in my experience in, in 25 years uh, in law enforcement, I can remember as a young police officer in New York City, uh, walking the streets, I was, uh, I had no radio, no police radio, no cell phone, no nothing. It was just me. And I had this very, very busy area uh, in the precinct and I was a rookie. But what I tried to do in that neighborhood where I worked eight to four, four to 12 and midnights, I always believed that if I got into trouble, if I had a problem, uh, whether it was mentally disturbed person or whatever I had to deal with at that point in time, I honestly believe that the community was at my back. Hopefully by the way I conducted myself mm -hmm. during all the other times that I wasn't in trouble, that I got to stand on school crossings and I got to see parents with children, many of the minority kids who had that big smile on their face and still believe, I think, uh, the police were good guys. And I always wanted to be a, a model, if you will, because I was the, the department's, indeed, the city's representative. I mean, I, I did it all. I delivered babies. I took them to the hospital. I mean, I did. I made arrests, too. I made a lot of arrests. And I gave summonses, and I did my job as best I could in the fairest way I could. But what I believe, as I said earlier, is about opportunity. I know that the New York City Police Department, really, in spite of what's been written, obviously are there some clearly that don't belong and we've got to get rid of them. What has to happen is that the community with the police department in a full-time relationship that become teammates for the community, that the, the community leaders should be a part of the training that would go on with the police officers from the very beginning, from the police academy right, right into the precinct. And they should feel welcome coming into the precinct because they are, they, they are, again, partners in creating a better situation. Hey, it's not going to be perfect. But let me tell you something, New York City Police Department is truly the crime laboratory of, of the nation. Programs that were started in New York very quickly, the hostage negotiation program, because what happened in Munich, what happened in Attica were, was created. And it's one of the most successful units, saved thousands of lives over the years. The Joint Terrorism Task Force, FBI, NYPD, because of all the bombings and stuff that was going on. I was the first commander of that unit. And it wasn't easy in the beginning. FBI and NYPD, they kind of didn't like each other. It took a while, but once we got to know each other and realized we both had talents to do the job, it's the most successful and is in every major city today. I believe that New York City can lead the way. And it, again, not overnight, but clearly, even with the neighborhood policing could be a, a, a first part of this, but come in, let's be part of it. Let's work together. And I don't believe in defunding the police. What I do believe is making the training the very, very best. And the community leaders would be a part of that from beginning to end, would see what was doing, would sit in on the training itself and explain to the officers what the difficulties are. And I'll tell you what, I was sad to hear a lot of what some of you said about not feeling part of it and the obstacles that are put in your way. That shouldn't be. Not in America, no way. 
and we've got to make things better. And this is such a great opportunity. Wouldn't it be great a year from today that us that panelists come back and say, guess what? We're not there yet. We got a ways to go, but we're, we've, we've taken the first steps. That's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of going forward. I still believe we're all God's children. Wow. So uh, thank you, Kevin. And, and thank you all for, for that, uh, for each of your uh, response. Um, I have a question, you know, a few questions, and maybe I'll just uh, throw them out there and we can just kind of tackle them. Um, Black Lives Matter, what does that mean? If there is a difference, is there a difference between the movement and the organization? Uh, Black Lives Matter's controversy on chanting for the death of cops and riots. And is it offensive when a, per when a person says all lives matter? Good okay. question. It's first, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, before before I answer that question, if you don't mind, I would like mm -hmm. to quickly go back to what Corey and Kevin have uh, mentioned. Uh, I live in Yukon, Connecticut, which is one of the wealthiest towns in, in America. But we cannot achieve social justice on the housing aspect of it for one simple reason most of the rich suburban area do not achieve the minimum required for uh, when it comes to low income housing to allow other family that are not predominantly white and rich to access the great school that people use as a, um, a way to kind of um, segregate a little bit further. And I have to say, I moved to New Canaan for the same reason as everybody coming out of New York City and originally from France. But uh, we were looking for schools where, first of all, we made a small mistake. We thought being in a private school in New, in New York City, we weren't getting the diversity we were looking for. So let's go to suburbia. And coming from abroad, I did not understand the, the suburban um, element. <laughs> and then when we moved in, I was like, ah, I have more diversity in Brooklyn than I have, I have here. <laughs> but True. live and learn, right? <laughs> but then I became a realtor once my boys were big, uh, uh, old enough to fend from themselves around town. And then I realized that there is a very, very big gap in what we can offer when it comes to low income housing and opportunities we can offer to uh, non white families to come to these communities. And so, Curry, I don't know, you, your project seems to be focused in New York, but do you know programs that do that around the country or different? Yeah, that they do. So come in? traditionally it's uh, public private partnerships. And so we did something similar in Birmingham because we we're working with a uh, NFL player out there. And basically it's the city says, hey, we have this initiative. We want to build, you know, this area. And it has to be a, it's a policy thing. And so it's initiated from the city saying, we have a desire to build in this area and we will give subsidies to the developers and the future homeowners. So for us, um, the city, our deal, just rough numbers, our deal is a $17 million deal. The city contributed $6 million of that in subsidies. That $6 million gets divided. We're doing 17 homes, so each home is a million dollars that subsidy gets divided amongst all 17 of those homes to make it affordable for them to purchase it. Now within that policy, when you buy that home, you cannot flip that home. You have to stay there for at least five years. And then, you know, you can look at options on selling, but it's not just easy to sell after five years either. They really want you there for 10 to 15 years. And that's just how the construct of it is. They've done it a few times in a couple of different cities. And basically a public private partnerships, you put the RFP out there and usually developers will find it and say, hey, here's an opportunity. We'll put some cash in, the city will put some cash in. And from an investor point of view, the, thing, the greatest thing about the United States is they have the strongest tax base in the world. So when you talk to an investor about partnering with the city, as long as that city's credit rating is good, then investors will get money to put behind a project 
because they know you're partnering with a tax base. So like for New York City, one of the strongest tax bases, our partners and investors are like, yeah, you're doing a partnership with New York City and Goldman Sachs money in it. We feel very comfortable that New York City is not going to lose. We feel very comfortable that Goldman Sachs is not going to lose. So when you look at something, let's say New Canaan, you'll say, or New Haven, you say, all right, we, you talk to the mayor or city council and say, hey, there's this empty land. For us, we're doing empty lots because it's scattered sites just because they were burnt down lots. And say, we want to develop that land. And the city takes that initiative on. So they write traditionally an RFI or an RFP, and they put that out to the community to see, hey, is there an interest from developers? Developers are obviously but capitalists. You know, sorry but, to interrupt you, but the whole thing is, I, we can talk about the, the, the detail of it, but what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that it comes for a will. There is a yes. will and- and, and has to be the will of the people. Exactly, it has to be the yes. will of the town to even yes. create that low housing opportunity for other right. families to be willing to come in. And, That's right. And, and to Kevin's Like point, you don't see that in Scarsdale. Scarsdale has no desire. I live in New Rochelle. And we Scarsdale don't see that in Connecticut. Uh, I mean, in lower Fairfield part of Connecticut either. So it's yeah. hard to give everybody the same opportunity when we cannot even attract them because there is a perception. I'm not going to move to New Canaan or Darien or Greenwich because it's a whole white neighborhood and I will not feel comfortable. And we and that's, that's where, yeah, that's where <laughs> policy is, right? So when people talk about get out the vote, it really is local first. Because right. if your policymakers are your average traditional white guys that grew up in that community, they, they have a limited way of seeing the world traditionally. Mm -hmm. And their job in that seat is to keep their job traditionally more than it is to make change. Mm -hmm. So then you have the voters who'll say, why are you bringing these low to moderate income housing to our area? Yeah. And they will lose their seat and they'll lose their job. So that's the hard part. Well, so, the, so that means that's, that, uh, that those low income neighborhoods or what, that, what you're talking about is a microcosm of America. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, I think that America should want all its people, right, to you succeed. Think, you will think this is why having the Black Lives Matter is so important because it, it transcended the organization, it transcended the creation of it because it, it, it is the basic fundamental. When we say Black Lives Matter, we're not saying white life don't matter, Hispanic life don't matter. To, things can exist in the same space at the same time, and they can be two rights or two wrongs. And saying Black Lives Matter and hear someone reply, all lives matter, it's like saying, oh yes, if you have a cancer and you, you are, as a woman, I'm very more proactive for breast cancer, does that negate all the other cancers? No, no. it just means that this is what is killing women the most, and I'm focusing on that. And that's right now, black people are the one dying the most. And let's focus on that. I'm not negating your life and I'm not frightening the non-white because I keep saying black, black life matter. So the, the controversy with the organization, it's what it is. It's to create a division. And they call Marxist, Marxist one day, they call um, socialists another day, they call, when you understand the difference between the isms, you cannot be all of it at once, except if you want to divide and conquer. Yeah, any, any other comments in regards to Black Lives Matter? I mean- I'll, I'll jump in Lowe's as mm -hmm. well. Um, I do find it, I find it offensive um, just for argument's sake. So, um, you know, I spend, spend a lot of time in the church um, and I used to joke all the time that, and our pastors would joke too, that a lot of times we have arguments. So if, even if we think about arguments with our wives or our husbands, in the midst of the argument, we're not in the process of listening. We're in the process mm -hmm. of formulating a response. Mm -hmm. And so to, re to respond immediately with all lives matter means that you are not even considering the conversation that we're trying to have. Well, I it's, think too, it's a protection. Um, 
I think there's a lot of fear that when people hear Black Lives Matter, they feel the status quo is going to change. And if you're happy with the status quo and you're in a position of, of wealth and you're in a position of privilege, um, no one wants to see that position taken from them or removed. And I think a lot of fear uh, of what's going on and how Black Lives Matter appear to them. And, and I agree, Derek, it's the context for which it's set in. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're having an argument and I'm telling you my life matters and you're telling me, oh, all lives matter, we're going to take it a certain way. And I think that's anyone. But we have to realize that no one likes to give up their spot. Um, and they are at the top. So <laughs> this is, I, I mean, we can talk about race relations. We yeah. can talk about everything else. We, I hear little things that are normal to our generation. So Derek, you're big, you're black. Mm -hmm. You don't want to talk too loud because you don't want to scare people. Where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for two, you, you don't want to move into a white neighborhood because you're going to feel uncomfortable. I live in a white neighborhood. I feel uncomfortable every time I walk down the street. That's normal. That's something that has been told to us because that's what we lived and grown up with. We have a generation now that's a little different. They have access to information. And right now they're saying we don't want to feel like that. Right. You know, I, I'll tell a quick story. I live in a white neighborhood. I'm 50 years old. Okay. My mother told me when I was nine years old, if you get stopped by the cops, put your hands on the wheel, take your hat off, and you do everything that they tell you to do. This is to save your life. This is something that we have already had. So I'm 50. I'm, I'm doing well. I know my tags. Everything is good. I'm rolling. When a cop pulls up behind me, I might have my hat on backwards. I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm taking my hat off. Yep. I'm checking the glove compartment and my insurance in there. And then when I talk to my white friend, they ain't never, they don't, they ain't like, oh, a cop's behind us. Oh, yeah, I'm noticing a cop from five blocks away. <laughs> so when I try to tell people, this is, this is, this is where we at. Like, <laughs> you know, our generation have been, has been ingrained that this is the way that it is, right? So when we see things, like what we've seen it's not unusual we know that that's going down it's not like it's not new to us it's new because now everybody's talking about it and everybody seems to say okay well where did this call come from and we've been saying this has been going on for, for, for years <laughs> so now i get the nfl you get brands i see commercials now black lives matter we're all in this together where were y'all nine months ago <laughs> Where were y'all nine months ago? Corporations now mm -hmm. are on the winning side because they see the purchasing power. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's it. Yeah. It's, not, it's not like they're trying to really stand in and say, okay, how do we enact change? The bank, Kevin Cohe, the black owned bank in Boston, right? Putting money where it can be actually utilized, having housing that can be utilized. All of those things are practical things that we can do or that people who say they want to help and want to be allies. What we're saying is, hey, we'll give you, they're saying we'll give you money, but we're going to kind of tell you how to spend that money. Mm, true. Mm -hmm. We're not going to let you figure out how to spend it mm -hmm. until we change where that money comes from. Mm -hmm. So I see the NBA. Oh my God. You, they are going Black Lives Matter like everything, right? <laughs> Are they talking to you, Corey? So I am talking to the Nets, but I got to tell you, they're trying to figure it out. Yeah. Right? Everybody is. Everybody right, is. so they're like, yeah. we want to do this. And this is me reaching out to them. This is a, them reaching out to me, right? This is like, all right, I see there may be an opportunity for the Nets to actually help them if they really are about it. And I get into those conversations are a lot like, yeah, you talk about you're about it. And then when I call you, I can't get in touch with you. Right. Like I'm on the ground floor. I'm actually doing the work and it's hard to get on the phone and you got to know someone. And I do have a great network. So I'm not going to discount that, but I, even with a great network, it's like, all right, we'll have a meeting and then no response, you know? And so, the PR of it, to your point, Kenyon, the PR of it is what people are buying into. They're not they, buying into the act. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to tell you guys, like I went to meet with the NFL social justice team. They got off the elevator. It was three white guys that were aged 26 to 28 years old. And I'm like, so you, this is who you sending out to talk about social justice to a league that's got 80% <laughs> African-American men. Right. And let me guess, you're not getting any traction because they don't really trust you. <laughs> Just uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, it, 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 you know, yeah, it's, yeah. I, I think you're dead on, you know, dead so on. the Black Lives Matter, and I want to, because I'm talking some of the things you said, and you talk about DNI. I, like, I'm probably one of the most angry black men, and I just became that over the past two years. <laughs> and so, when you look at DNI, and I've talked to a lot of you know diversity and inclusion executives within corporations, and majority of times they're black, but they don't have a budget, right? So, I got one staff member. Maybe I can help out with five thousand dollars. So we had this initiative this summer, Save Our Youth. And because we knew that New York City had eliminated all the summer youth employment programs. Luckily, I had a strong relationship with the COO of Robinhood. They raised their hand and said, we'll give a million dollars. I went to a couple of other organizations. They're like, oh, well, we really don't have it. I had an organization that said, we'll put in, you know, we'll match Robinhood. And then their CEO got a tailwind of it. It was from their DNI officer who said, let's do this. The CEO was like, oh, I don't know. We, you know, we've been doing other things. So, and it's a multi-billion dollar organization. So it becomes like, all right, do Black Lives really matter? Or is this a PR, you know, is this a PR stunt? And that's, you know, on from the pragmatic on the boot ground, ground level, does it really matter? Because I don't see it in execution. And so, you know, to go to, and I only go to the question of does when I hear Black Lives Matter, and to your point, Kenyon, and also Derek, as a black man, luckily, <laughs> it's funny, Kevin, you'll like this. My brother was a member of JTTF back during 9 11 and did a ton of tours out in Africa and had the FBI NYPD shield. And so he passed that along to me. So that gave me a lot of confidence and comfort when it came to being pulled over by the police. Even to this day, I'm probably more arrogant with police than your average black person. <laughs> but I know, because and I also played football in college and ended up playing football as a ringer on the NYPD team. So once I got to know these guys, like, well, these are regular guys. And so what I started understanding was, is how you approach them and also, what I like to do is say, look, man, I'm a taxpayer. You're supposed to defend me. This is what Doc Rivers say. Like, why do we have to beg for you to do your job the right way? You can't do your job to one race and not the other race. You're getting paid by taxpayers of all nationalities, all colors. So why do you do your job differently to a certain race versus another race? Because they all pay you. Mm. And no one ever, you know, to my, in my opinion, no one ever says, hey, you got to do your job. Well, Doc Rivers said, you got to do your job no matter what the race is. And I don't care what your previous history is of dealing with blacks. Like, your job is to protect and serve everyone. You're not protecting and serving white people. You're protecting and serving everyone. But why is it that you're not protecting and serving? We don't feel, and I know this, we don't feel like police are there to protect and serve. They're actually adversaries. And now it's growing up, because I grew up in the hood, you never talk to the police, ever. But, okay, like, but my question on that is going back to, again, what Derek said. Like, if you didn't grow up around black people and you're a white police officer and someone like myself that's big or Derek gets out of the car and his voice goes up and, you know, we are expressive people. It's our culture. And you might take that as a threat because... You don't know. I live in a white neighborhood. I go to a basketball game. If I raise my voice, they like, oh my God, he's right. he's he's so upset. Why is he so passionate? And it's just I'm like, this is how I enjoy a game. Like and it's not disrespectful, but if I'm on the other side of that and you put me in a neighborhood that has a higher crime rate, higher suspicion, right? 
and you tell me to patrol it, I don't really know the neighbors because like Kevin said, I'm not seeing them walk to school with their parents. I don't see them. I'm not, they don't see me, but you want me to police this neighborhood. There's, that's a, to me, a recipe for disaster. Yeah, don't have experience. Fear, so then, fear becomes a driving force there. Once, yeah. you, once you create those situations and uh, more towns are now creative community policing and all that, but the, the deep and trust on both sides is so, has been there for so long, is generational almost. How do you pass that? Uh, is it because, Kevin, you can speak to that. I, my understanding is that the police training has been a military style training uh, more and more. So how do you go from that training to try to be the lamb in a neighborhood that is predominantly black or minority? Because that's not your training. Your training is to react. And once the word I, I felt threatened, is out there, that's the end of the conversation, basically. And that has been the case so far. Thanks to camera, now we have uh, the different version. So how do you, um, what do you think, Kevin? Uh, so uh, you, yeah, Kevin, I think he had a comment before that, and then I want him to answer your question. Then I have a question, then I have a few questions of sh uh, shifting from Black Lives Matters, but listen, uh, slipping into a policing. So Kevin, you had a com you you wanted to make a comment, and then she, Fatou had a com uh, a question for you. Yes, actually, uh, what Kenya said, I, I heard him say about dealing with the NFL. And these three white guys get off the elevator, and uh, you know they're 26, 27. One of the first things I did at Major League Baseball, because I was a uh, as the players would say, hey, he was a cop. What the hell can he tell us? And the club said, he's from New York. He thinks he has all the answers. What does he know about baseball? One of the first things I did was there was a terrific uh, friend of mine, black gentleman who had been uh, with DEA. And he and I just got a, he came over when I got hired and we chatted. He says, hey, listen, I got a guy for you that I think is really going to help you. And this guy was a six foot five black gentleman in Philadelphia. He was a detective. And I said, oh, he sounds interesting. I took a ride down to Philly. And I never forget, I went in a restaurant and he came in about five minutes later. He looked like he walked out of G, uh, what do they call it, GQ. I mean, this guy was dressed. I mean, uh, the thing I didn't like about him, he was too damn handsome. That was another problem. <laughs> that I had with him. But we, we had a conversation about the street and about sports and about baseball. And this gentleman was my first hire in Major League Baseball. And I remember that uh, Reggie Jackson, we went out to California to do a presentation uh, for the Angels. And I walked into the clubhouse and uh, Reggie Jackson was in there. He was doing a broadcast with Joe Torrey that day of the Angel game. And he sees me and Al. And he walks over to Al and says to Al, what's with this guy? In <laughs> fact, he did say, what's with this white guy? <laughs> and Al looked at him. He said, he hired me. And after that, Reggie Jackson became my best friend. I mean, it was, it was really something, but what, it, what has to be done and what I wanted to do, I wanted not only to have somebody that I trusted and respected, et cetera, et cetera. And, and being black was just another positive about him as to who he was. And by the way, I have to add that uh, three of my kids went to Villanova and it turns out that my buddy son was an outstanding basketball player and he was trying to decide what college he was going to go to. And I quickly told my new hire, he's going to Villanova. This ain't civil service. You're going to be gone tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so fair enough. He went to Villanova, all American, ended up in the NBA. I'm not going to drop names, but uh, we talk later. I'll let you know. But that was really important. And it's so important. And, and getting to Patu's question about how do you go from the military training to community understanding, hey, look, we got to start. We got to start at the, not only at the police academy, but I want to get into the precincts. I want the community readers to be with us. 
I want them to understand that it, we're going to be more successful with the community on our side. I want the young people to know what we can do and who we are. And if we got some bad actors in policing, let's find out who they are and get them out. And one of the things that I am fully supportive of is a national registry of police yeah. officers who get into this kind mm -hmm. of trouble. And so it, it shocked me so many times to see police officers who did unbelievable bad things, had a terrible disciplinary record, and they're hired by another department. Mm -hmm. What? How can mm -hmm. that be? What goes on? So get that national registry up. We want to know who these bad actors are because we have to work to make it better. And let me just comment on Black Lives Matter. You know, all of you have said it so right. It's not about prejudice. It's not about, you know, it's just about us. Black Lives Matter right now because you folks have laid it out as to what you've been going through. And we have got to now make a difference to make it a better situation across the board, obviously in finance and, 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 and on the streets, all of it. None of us should be scared of the police. Truly, as you said, Corey, we are there to protect and serve. And those who don't should not be part of this. It's too important to all of us. So it's a matter of getting started. Again, in the, in the police academy, community leaders talking and explaining what, what, what a person feels by the way they're treated because their, their skin color is different. It's horrific. I grew up in the South Bronx and I can tell you, I never had any issues with any of that because we were in it together. We were teammates, we were friends. That's what it's about. And the more you get to know this panel today, the opportunity to, to meet with all of you, it's an honor for me. And I mean that sincerely. And it's terrific. And just very quickly on the sports thing, I got my players to actually in each city, I had a police officer who worked full time, correction, part time as a security consultant to work with the team. So the players were having the same thing. Well, you know, I'm in this different city, et cetera, et cetera. This policeman helped break it down. And after a year or two, they got really comfortable. I brought them into spring training. And I had them talk to the players about their relationship with the police. They're concerned about their families. They're concerned about their kids. And I, I, I don't know if I, I put it aside, but every one of them got what I call an RSA card, resident security agent. So when that player was on the road, and his wife is calling that she's getting stalked or a player's mom is getting threatening phone calls. Get to that. He calls that police officer and that police officer gets busy. It's about helping each other. And another thing, I worked very closely with the NBA, with Horace Palmer. Any of you know that name? Horace, yes, definitely. Anybody know Don Gibson, uh, who, mm -hmm. who ran your Hall of Fame? Mm -hmm. all, all good buddies of mine. Our NFL, I worked with. I took from four leagues at that time, $50,000 from each one. I'll never forget uh, uh, David, uh, the NBA, sat in a meeting when I came in and asked for $50,000 to do a state-of-the-art video called Gambling With Your Life. It was probably, I don't know if you ever saw it, one of the best videos, got all, all kinds of awards, but more important than that, it was about the players. And it was about what they were facing, the challenges. So too, getting back to policing, that's what we got to do. We got to come together. This can happen. I I'm, I'm really feel confident, but it's about leadership. It's not just allowing it to, okay, hey, we're doing this. That can't be it. There's got to be leadership in each place and communication and caring. Is it going to be perfect? Absolutely not. But not trying. Shame on us. Well, yeah, and uh, you know, definitely, um, we we are on here for an hour, and I think tw uh, twenty five minutes, um, and time does fly, and that's why we say this is going to take more than one panel. That's why we say a series of panels, because I, you know, I have nine questions, and inside those questions, there are questions uh, that we 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 need to address. Um, I agree with Kevin, one of the first starts, and 
since the pandemic and all these things are happening, I, I, I started a, pro, a podcast called uh, Lowe's More in the Blueprint. And, uh, you know, I started out with uh, dealing with these issues. And number one, as a former professional athlete, you know, and some, there are two words for me, uh, to be tolerated or to be tolerant, right? And I, I think in, in this climate or this season, of America, right? Uh, I think for a long time, you know, African-American people has just been uh, tolerated, not tolerant, right? Uh, You know, and as long as there was leadership that, you know, was there fighting for all, you know, everyone and trying to make, open up opportunities for everybody and uh, you know, not to the degree that we're we're trying to we're discussing today, where we need to really open it up. But you know, we we as a people have made some major steps, not uh, to the degree we want to make those steps, but at least we were we were somewhat moving in the right direction. And then you get leadership, right, that causes this thing. We realize that we were just being tolerated. Right. I mean, and 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 uh, it's a difference between being tolerated and being tolerant, because I have accepted the fact that there is a difference between my culture and other cultures and that we do things differently. And and you know what? At the end of the day, that's OK. Right. And, and I think that for me, that as an athlete, you know, that was the power of sports, because. You know, all my t- teammates were African American. I went to West Virginia University, so you know. But we became real because of the sport. Uh, we broke down some barriers. They realized that uh, you know, I listen. I listen to different music. I eat, I eat different for you, food. Uh, we do different things, and and vice versa. But at the end of the day, you know, one of my teammates ended up being, you know, in my in my a groom in my wedding, and we became best friends. He ended up impacting my kids. I mean, uh, every time they, they came into Pittsburgh, he, he wanted to take them around and drop them off. That's some of the power of sports. When we, we talk about sports, it, it allows us to get to know one another and get from just you tolerating me to tolerance where we accept our differences, but yet we be, still become friends. And I, I think America is a, still a long way from <laughs> what that word tolerant means. You know, and uh, so we, we only have a few more minutes, but I, I want to bring up this question because you, t- you, you were talking about policing, right? Uh, uh, Kevin, it says here, and these are, these are three, three, three questions again, right? Uh, uh, negative police encounters, a brief explanation of police training regarding the effects of negative police encounters, right? And then uh, number two, uh, is there a difference in the training of police and security, right? And then uh, the president of the Toronto Raptors, I mean, many of you would remember this, um, Messiah Jury, right, uh, who was the president. He's attempting to, uh, after his team wins the championship in, the, in, in California, He's attempting to take out his badge when he's pushed several times, right? And, and uh, you know, here's a man who has his credentials, right? But then he's treated totally different. I mean, everybody walked by, pulled their credentials, but it happened to them. So when you have encounters, I mean, if you don't have a policy, if you don't have a, a training for encounters, when, it, when an encounter happens, like the ones we've seen recently, Right. There should be some training. And, uh, you know, I want to open that up in regards to policing. Well, I'll start and just say that you can have all the training in the world. It needs to be accountability for when mistakes happen. And here's the deal. We're all accountable for our mistakes. And those that we put into positions of power, like police, have a higher level of accountability. Um, They need to think before they do things and what those ramifications are. But what this 
kind of biased immunity that they have when they do make mistakes. I think a lot of them, we can understand that mistakes do happen. The problem is what happens after that mistake? Is it a culture of protection? And uh, I think just from my perspective, I, I think accountability is we're all held accountable for what we do. They should be held accountable for what they do. If I could respond to that, uh, Kenyon, you're you're right. What what would happen, and, and I saw it particularly in my early years, and even sometimes later, that mistakes were made, and they were com compounded by covering it up and mm -hmm. uh, trying to uh, you know push it away and 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 not get justice for what really happened. But I can tell you that, that that has changed dramatically. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But I can tell you that police officers today are a lot more sensitive and maybe it's, it's cameras and, and uh, all that kind of stuff <laughs> yes. that obviously impacts on it. And quite honestly, I, I would say the same thing for you uh, former athletes that uh, uh, we 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 talked a lot about cameras and and filming and and all that in, in spring training, but the police posture today it is a more honest police officer than has been the history in the New York City Police Department. And I can recall uh, again a young policeman uh, in Manhattan. There were two officers who rode together in the same car. And me and my partner used to call them Frank and Jess, James, because these these guys were just known that they were, you know, picking up money here and there and, and doing favors and, and, and uh, you know, using their jobs to their own end. Well, that today is not uh, in, uh, going on at NYPD to the extent that it was. It's, it's shaped up dramatically. IAD and all the police officers, and I can tell you, I'm still in touch. I, I belong to a group called PAPA, which I've been part of for 12 years. And basically it's active and retired police officers, uh, men and women, and, and uh, quite honestly, minorities and women make up 50% of this group. They're all volunteers. The clinicians are volunteers, the psychiatrists, the psychologists, everybody's a volunteer. We do it on our own time, 24-7, to help policemen who have issues. So it, it's come together. And quite honestly, the police department now, I believe, is 49% minorities, which is great. It reflects the city. It's, it's, it's a better police department, no question about it. But again, we have our issues, and they have to be addressed, and they have to be addressed more quickly. We cannot have department trials and all this kind of stuff. They should be fired right off the bat. That's the first thing that should happen. I'm not uh, saying that they shouldn't get justice, but the, the issues sometimes are out there. What they did is on film. We see it, et cetera, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, administrative leave would pay. What? You giving them mm -hmm. vacation for what they <laughs> did? There is just so many things that we can do to tighten it up. And hearing from the community, as I said, having them as partners, with us and helping us get a, get this thing squared away and make a difference in the community, make make all people, what, what, whatever ethnic, ethnicity, that we're on their side and where there, there are police officers that are not performing as they should, they should be put out of work in a hurry. Well, yeah, and another thing is that, you know, uh, Corey and Kevin, you know, I mean, Corey has a model uh, these these things need to be if they're successful, they need to be looked at, researched, and and duplicated. Uh, if if policing is good in New York City, or and they got a model that uh, is addressing issues and and different things, because it wasn't always that way. But um, and 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 if it is, you know, I don't know why we wouldn't be modeling these things in other in other cities throughout the nation. Um, and we're coming to a close and, and I want to make uh, uh, 
for for four weeks, I, I, I was doing a series called the Breathe series. You heard Dave mention when it, when I uh, when we first came on, and you know, I just from from my perspective, I just got tired of you know when you can't breathe, and we've heard a lot of this. I mean, we we all were privy to what happened to George Floyd and so many others over the uh, over these last few months and years. And I, I mean, I just got like, like overwhelmed because I felt like I couldn't breathe and it, and it put us all in what, with the pandemic, it put us all in a state of fear, a spirit of fear. And, and for me, uh, I, I looked at it as this is in our, uh, what I call bottom up thinking, you know, or a bottom up mindset. And, 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 and that, uh, when you think from the bottom, you think from your humanity, you think from your intellect, you think from your emotion, and then you think from your experience. And and what happened as a reaction to I can't breathe, right, was protest and all the other things. And yeah, there were legitimately people out there who were authentic and real about protesting and trying to get real answers response to to these solutions to these issues and you know at the end of the day mixed in there there were other situations jumping in there other organizations jumping in there and causing confusion and causing riots and all kind of different things like that that played a part and we started the breathe series because you know i mean america talks about in god we trust so we started the breathe series so we we started to think about like how you know, what's God's perspective on this? What's God's viewpoint on, on this? And only through him that this is what we were dealing with. Only through him can we breathe. Right. And, and many of the actions that uh, that I stated earlier from the bottom up, we, we, we didn't really talk about God. We pray. Right. And, and, and for those who may not believe in God, that there, there, there's just certain principles in, in, in that belief system that, when you start to talk about from the from the top down, right? When you start talking about from a kingdom of talent, I started to think about how do we breathe, right? How do we breathe? How do we respond? And I think on this on on this next several panel discussions, we need to get to remember we, we were saying, right, we, we wanna we wanna listen, right? We, we want to listen. We've been we listening to each other, mm-hmm. and and then ultimately, you know, we want to communicate, and then we want to respond. We we want to end up at the end of three series with some some a real practical application or plan, so how so people can move forward and 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 not live by fear but live by faith, right? And and and. Uh, you know, feel the liberties that maybe one culture may feel and that all cultures should be feeling that liberty, you know? So, um, you know, I just wanted to make that statement that we, we're we trying to be responsive here. We heard, we heard, we are hearing all, you know, what the issues are and Corey and Kevin have mentioned some things and even, you know, everybody else has mentioned some things on, the, on, on this, uh, this series that we could take with us and and we can breathe and hopefully we'll develop this as we go along. And I want to turn it back over uh, to, to David, man. And um, I do appreciate everybody for coming on and, and uh, I value everything that you said is just not enough time. And uh, hopefully we're going to give you some more time and uh, to address more issues. Uh, David. Thank you, Lois. And uh <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, we could probably sit here for another another two hours easily, and uh, and obviously respect everybody's time and, and the participants as well for joining us. Um, we, as noted, we will uh, have this uh, posted, uh, this recording, and, and thank you all. Uh, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> thank you, Derek. Great to see you again. Kenyon, uh, it's great to see you. Fatu, thank you so much. Corey, I'm sorry again for your technical problems, but I'm no glad, Fine. glad you made it. Uh, you all see Mark now and Gene, my teammates on Sports Business Institute. Mark, is, Mark said he would buy everybody a beer once we get socially ready. <laughs> so, all right. Look forward to that. Um, at the end of the day, 
Um, I just want to share this because we didn't really have any questions in the chat room, but somebody did post this. So I won't share their name because I'm not sure if they would want me to. Uh, they said, no question, but I want to say what a blessing this discussion has been. Please continue this. I'm so proud of you all. So, and I guess the last thing that I'll share, two, one of two things that I'll share is what scares me the most is when I talk to somebody and, and they say, I don't have a racist bone in my body. Well, maybe you don't, um, but at the end of the day, don't think that you can't participate or become part of the progress or the discussion or the moving forward or the, you know, fat two with the, you know, with the peaceful protest, my daughter did that. I wasn't able to do it that day, but the, listen, it, we, 